All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again, everyone, for being on our first uh, Trout Unlimited California staff speaker series um, for today. Um, we have both Anna Halligan, the North Coast Coho Project Director, and Tim Prom, the Central Coast Steelhead Project Director. Um, so both of these staff members have been a part of Trout Unlimited for a while and done some great work for our trout, salmon, and steelhead. Um, just a little bit before we get started, um, the staff speaker series was just um, something that both our grassroots and staff decided to do, to do decided to do to engage um, with our grassroots and our partners more um, through kind of a um, presentation slash uh, open Q and A session. Um, so, uh, in order for you all um, to one get a link sent to you after this presentation with the video of the presentation sent, and then also to continue to connect with both staff and chapters, uh, we would love for you to use the chat function um, on your screen to send both your name and email to um, us as panelists. Um, and when you use the chat function and send your name and email, make sure it selects all panelists because this will allow for you to maintain privacy. Um, and again, it's a, a discrete way to stay connected and make sure that all questions um, within this session are answered as well. If you do have a question at any time during this um, webinar series, please use the Q&A uh, function on your screen. And myself, Charlie, and Sam uh, will make sure that we get to your questions as well. Um, we will try to have an extended question time after the staff uh, talk about their programs, but um, that will be a little bit extra at the end. And if you all are willing to stay on longer, we'll make sure to get to as many questions as possible. Um, if you have any questions at all during the talk, specifically tech questions or Zoom questions, please email me at samuel.cedu at tu.org. You should be able to see that email address on the screen right now. Um, also, please make sure to connect with us uh, via social media as well. Uh, both our Facebook and Instagram pages are linked there and any future staff speaker series engagements, um, as well as any um, future events or news will be posted both on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Um, lastly, we hope that you enjoy these talks. Uh, they'll be about 20 minutes each with about a five to 10 minute um, questionnaire at the end of them. And then as I mentioned earlier, we'll have an extended questionnaire at the end as well. Um, so our first talk is going to be Anna Halligan, who's the director of our North Coast Coho Project, as I mentioned, and she's been with Trout Unlimited since 2013. Um, so with that, I'm gonna let her take it from there and um, let's get started. Okay. There we go. All right. Am I up and running? Yep, All looks right. good. Awesome. Okay. So um, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I'm Anna Halligan. I direct the North Coast Coho Project. And um, I'll start a little bit with a little history about our program and then talk more about what we've been up to today. Um, this project was first conceived in 1998 under the direction of Steve Trafton, who is still a TU employee and now manages our Cold Water Conservation Fund. Steve knew working in Mendocino Coastal Streams was important for salmon recovery, and he wanted to get some project work started. So he got a tip initially, I think from a, a North Bay TU chapter member to connect with Craig Bell, who was a steelhead guy and a restoration consultant that was living in the area. Um, in addition to being an angler and a restoration professional, Craig had also worked as a logger and he was really committed to reducing sediment and restoring fish habitat in the Garcia. So he had been working in that watershed since the early 90s and had had muted success. The former landowner, Louisiana Pacific, was not all that willing to engage in restoration outside of the stream channel. So Craig could add wood, but he really couldn't address any of the significant sediment issues that were impacting the watershed. So Craig let Steve know about this new conservation-minded timber company 
that had purchased the Louisiana Pacific ownership. And um, together they developed a plan to try and engage with this new landowner and embark on watershed scale restoration. The company ended up being the Mendocino Redwood Company. And that company is our one of our longest standing conservation partners. Um, so Craig kind of figured that since Louisiana Pacific was out of the picture, there might be a chance to bring in some outside road experts to assess the sediment problems in the watershed. And they reached out to MRC and that's pretty much how the North Coast Coho, uh, excuse me, North Coast Coho project began. Um, they, it, kind of established this goal that they wanted to reduce sediment in the South Fort Garcia watershed by 72%. And they also wanted to do in-stream work. So they um, started that by hiring the Pacific Watershed Associates, which is a geologic consulting firm. And they conducted a basin-wide sediment assessment. And then that resulted in some accompanied road sediment reduction work. MRC you know, really wanted to incorporate restoration into its business model, and it was um, happy to engage in that pilot effort and was particularly interested in um, replicating the effort in other parts of its ownership. They even were open to training their timber operators and their roads crews in the specific techniques that, that were being employed to reduce sediment, and they adopted that as their standard kind of operations. And we continue to work with MRC and we've replicated this basin-wide approach to restoration in other watersheds on their land and with their sister company, Humboldt Redwood Company, as well as with other timber partners. So why did TU create a program focused specifically on coho salmon? Well, <laughs> about 80 years ago, there were records that we had returns in California of in the you know amount of 400,000 adults. And today, um, you know, kind of according to the most recent data that we have available to us, um, those returns now occur anywhere between one and 6% of those 1940s estimates. So, um, is that, can everyone see my PowerPoint? I see some stuff in the chat. Just wanna make sure things are working. But um, stop me if, if there are significant tech issues. Um, so historically, there was an estimated five and a half million salmon that returned to California rivers every year. And then since about the 1950s, less than 500,000 fish on average are counted. Chinook make up more than 90% of those numbers. And since 2000, hatchery fish represent over 25%. Um, of in-river angler harvest, and um, that's about 15% of total salmon returns. These declines triggered state and federal protective measures like the Forest Practice Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, about 47% of California salmon are already recognized as threatened or endangered or extinct. And at the current rate, um, California stands to lose 45% of its remaining native salmonids in the next 50 years, unless significant actions are taken to stem the decline. So this may sound really dismal, <laughs> but I think it's important to understand a few things before we give up hope. For one, there is a lot of variation over time when you look at annual salmon returns. So the image I have up right now is just looking at coho, but notice, you know, there's, there's peaks and there's ebbs in those numbers. Um, over the last 10 years, coho salmon returns have ranged from 1,600 to 30,000 annually. And so when you look at this graph on the top, we have the endangered Central California coast coho salmon. Um, there's, there's no hatchery data for that because um, we don't run a hatchery program here on the Mencino coast or within the range of Central California coastal coho salmon. When you look in the middle, you're looking at the Southern Oregon, Northern California coastal coho salmon. They are threatened um, and they are supplemented by hatchery fish. And so the, the teal bars at the top show those hatchery numbers. Um, and the numbers that are displayed actually aren't totals. I don't know why um, this table was put together like that. They're actually just showing the hatchery numbers. But main point is 
you know, there's a lot of variation. And, and for CCC coho, the, the coho that are endangered, we're seeing small but marked improvements. Um, the Southern Oregon, Northern California coastal coho, unfortunately, since 2015, have had um, a bit of a decline. And that is almost entirely explained by the Trinity River because a lot of the other populations in other rivers are significantly smaller. Um, and I bring this up because I think it's really important for us to understand that, that um, although the, over, the overall population is in decline, there are streams that are showing upward population trends. So here's a look at some Mendocino coastal streams with um, the most recent annual returns for salmon and steelhead. Um, the returns this year uh, have some updates about returns that are happening right now too. But um, you'll notice for the most part, we are seeing an upward tick in our coho returns and in our steelhead returns. Um, and, you know, for Chinook, we can, I can explain that a little bit more, but our systems are a lot smaller um, than the systems that Chinook regularly occupy. So although they are present, they're not a dominant species here um, on the, the Mendocino coast anyways. So um, I got some good news this week about uh, salmon returns. And even though this year, a lot of the returns were delayed by low flows and um, winter storms, the reports over the last few weeks are that the coast is completely teeming with spawners right now. Initial reports indicate above average fish returns in several places. Surveyors had 90 records on Casper Creek just this week. And in Pudding Creek, um, the fisheries biologist for Lime Redwood Forest Company says that she's seen the highest number of returning adults in the entire time that she's worked on the coast. In the Noyo, there were 14 coho that entered the Coastal Monitoring Project's monitoring station last week. Um, the total for the season is 67. Um, we haven't really seen a lot of steelhead yet, um, but there are reports of them coming in in the eel and other places. So it's a great time to go get out in the creeks and look for spawners. Um, it's also essential to understand that recovery is possible. And so here I'm showing um, a year where in the Noyo, we actually had enough returns that we exceeded the recovery target. So if we can just keep doing that, we in theory will have a population that can um, be self-sustained. So now that you have a better idea of why the North Coast Coho Project was created, I'd like to just kind of focus on what we're working on now. Um, the mission of our program it, for, you know, for our work really relies on strong partnerships. It's scientifically driven. Our work, we like to think that it stimulates local and regionally based economies. And that's primarily because we work with a lot of local loggers, foresters, uh, professional consultants and construction firms. And this was particularly evident during the 2018 recession and actually during the earliest months of the coronavirus. Um, we've been able to keep people employed and doing the good work that they do despite some of the downfalls of um, national and uh, global politics or economics. Um, in order to uphold TU's mission to conserve, protect and restore North America's cold water fisheries, um, we follow a basic conservation framework and the North Coast Coho Project's work is really focused on um, that restore component of our conservation framework. Um, so we're, most of the work we do is on the ground habitat restoration, although we do work really closely with other TU staff on uh, stream flow enhancement, science and policy initiatives as well. Most of the um, NCCP staff work on securing grants. That's a big part of what we do to support the development and the execution of these restoration projects. So as you can see, um, since our inception, we've raised approximately $28.5 million. And those funds have been spread out across about 134 independent restoration projects. Uh, we're primarily funded by state and federal grants. Although I should reference that this pie chart is maybe slightly skewed, and that's in part just due to the way that um, our database was created. But 
a lot of the state funds that we receive actually come from the federal government through the Pacific Coast Salmon Restoration Fund. Um, and then the rest of the funds come directly from landowners and from private foundations or organizations. Most of our project work is focused on implementation. 70% um, of all of those 134 projects that we've completed were implementation projects with another 10% represented by planning and assessments, 10% represented by engineered designs, and then to a much lesser extent, we've had independent projects focused on monitoring, although we do try to incorporate monitoring in almost all of the work that we do. So we are working from Humboldt to Marin, and we have projects, most of our work um, occurs in about 16 major watersheds. The majority of our restoration does occur in Mendocino County, um, and we work on public and private land. Um, and regardless of whatever the current use of that land is today, most of these watersheds have a history of timber extraction and to some extent ranching or both. Uh, although our program was first conceived to focus on coho salmon restoration work, our work benefits North Coast steelhead trout as well. And you can kind of see that our project work overlaps with the um, geography in the range of these species. But we also do work that benefits Chinook salmon. And again, I, I mentioned that's primarily just because we have a lot less Chinook returning to our streams. A lot of the streams that we work in are um, just smaller in size. And I'm, I know I, I just mentioned that um, strong partnerships with agencies and landowners and other resource professionals are integral to our success. Um, our program is comprised of two full-time staff and one part-time staff. Um, and on average, we construct about 12 projects a year. I think we had one year where we may have constructed 14 or 16 projects. Um, but on average, it's about 12. And then we usually have another, you know, half dozen projects under development. Um, and we literally could not do this if we couldn't rely on our partners to help us. Um, our partners include private landowners, um, private consultants, other nonprofits, local RCDs, construction firms, resource professionals, and of course, agencies. Um, we rely on the agencies pretty heavily, one for funding, but also we rely on the recovery plans that they've developed. And we, um, we work with the agencies to help guide us as we develop projects. Most recently, we've been involved in a pretty cool process called SHARP. It's the Salmon Habitat and Restoration Priorities um, process or method. And it was developed, well, it's, it's being um, developed in California by NOAA Fisheries and CDFW. And right now, um, the shark program is occurring in Mendocino Coastal Streams, um, the South Fork and Lower Eel River, the Lower Russian River and Lagunitas Creek. And the intent of SHARP is to basically take the recommendations that are in recovery plans and then refine them to um, recommendations that occur on a reach level for specific project types. So we've been really involved with that lately and we really appreciate our agency support and guidance. Uh, we try to use the best uh, scientific principles that are available to us when we're developing our projects. We really try to focus on addressing the source of habitat degradation rather than the effect. We also attempt to understand what ecological processes are driving current conditions, and we use those processes to also establish restoration goals and objectives. We attempt to work in watersheds where we know fish are present, and we rely pretty heavily on the coastal monitoring project data to do that. Mendocino actually has one of the longest um, CMP data sets in the state. And when the data isn't there, we embark on our own studies. Uh, we have a six year uh, before after control impact study in Pudding Creek that's focused on um, salmonid response to large wood treatments. And we're working with the Redwood Empire to support um, a Didson uh, monitoring effort in the main stem eel that's really focused on Chinook and steelhead returns. Um, 
We also conduct a lot of post-project effectiveness monitoring whenever possible so that we can learn from our projects, but also so that we can adapt them as needed. Uh, we have a long history of using innovative techniques. Um, although we didn't create the accelerated recruitment approach to large wood loading, it's certainly possible that we've relied on it more than any other entity in the state. Um, this accelerated recruitment strategy, just as an aside, um, is an approach to large wood loading that really um, relies on direct falling of trees into streams and occasionally where appropriate we'll use um, like a rubber tired skitter or backhoe. And the idea is to um, increase the pace and scale of wood loading. We commonly will treat an entire system um, and it's a very cost effective and efficient way to provide rapid recruitment of large wood in stream. Um, most of our systems riparian stands are just not mature enough to naturally recruit at the rate that's needed for um, adequate in-stream complexity. And we really are just trying to mimic and kickstart an ecological process by using this method. Um, we really try to look at the entire watershed from source to sea and to the best extent possible. We try to be strategic and phase restoration activities as they align with recovery plans and watershed plans. Um, we also need to evaluate all of the past land use practices and the current factors that are limiting salmon production when we're developing these projects. Um, there's a myriad, as you can see on screen, there's a, a myriad of um, factors that we have to take into consideration in each um, stream system, sometimes even in specific reaches of certain streams, we can have a variety of things going on. Um, so now I really want to talk about the work that we do and what that looks like when, you know, you're kind of evaluating the impacts to a stream and then trying to determine what type of project work to do. So I really like this image um, that the Nature Conservancy uh, put together, although I have to admit I've kind of um, butchered it a little bit, added some things. Um, but it shows, it's a pretty good depiction of like how to approach watershed restoration. So, you know, um, in the headwaters, we look to reduce sediment. And more recently, we've been getting involved in a lot more um, forest health initiatives. And, um, and then as you're moving downstream, we're looking at restoring stream flow and removing barriers, reconnecting floodplains, um, reintroducing large wood and restoring estuaries. Um, and so a lot of the work, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, every restorationist approach maybe to, to, to watershed restoration. Most of the work that our program's really focused on is reducing sedimentation, removing barriers, reintroducing large wood into streams, and reconnecting floodplains. And I mentioned, we're just starting to have, um, we're trying to pilot a few new initiatives that are really focused on managing forest health, looking at creating uneven aged uh, forest stands that are more fire resilient, that are more capable of holding water in the soil, um, and, and um, just provide a, a better, um, more resilient watershed habitat overall. Um, so when we talk about fish passage improvement, our program has removed about 13 major barriers. That doesn't include a lot of the small crossings that we've improved through our road sedimentation work, but independent fish passage projects um, fall within that number. And that's restored access to about 63 miles of habitat. Um, here's an example of a stream crossing replacement uh, that happened on the iconic skunk train. So these two images are before pictures. Um, you can see that there's this uh, culvert where the, the, the end of the, the culvert has broken off. Um, the image on the right is looking, is standing on the top uh, at the railroad and looking down. This is on the Upper Noya River. And, um, and it, in addition to being a fish passage barrier, this site was a pretty significant um, sediment source as well. And this is what it looks like this summer. We finished this project that is a 50 foot spanning arch that will provide passage for 
all life stages of fish and actually provides habitat for wildlife now too, that they will no longer will need to go across the rail at this site. Um, we've been involved in a few small scale dam removal projects. This is Olds Creek, uh, which is a tributary to the Noya River. And what you're looking at on the left is a relic concrete sill that was remaining from an old mill pond. Um, it was a long forgotten uh, component um, of this old lumber mill. In fact, the entire mill and the town, which was called Ermolco, has essentially been erased from the landscape, but, but that concrete sill still remained. And using relatively low-tech approach, we were able to remove that. Um, I just mentioned that a lot of our fish passage work that we've completed is associated with work on timber roads, and that involves both decommissioning uh, old stream crossings and upgrading old stream crossings. So if you look at this image, on the left, you'll see um, there's a blue arrow that's kind of trying to show a frame of reference. I apologize, I wish these pictures were the same scale, but this is an older project. Um, the top photo on the left is showing there's a stump and that's what the blue arrow is pointing at, but that is how much fill <laughs> was in the stream channel as a result of a road being built across it and it had an undersized culvert and was failing. And then the picture below it shows what that channel looks like after that fill is removed and that road is decommissioned. The picture on the right shows an example of a crossing upgrade where again, we have one of my favorite contractors, Ed Kurtai, standing there for scale. On the top, you see an undersized culvert that's perched, clearly a fish passage barrier, and that's been replaced with a bridge. And so in talking about uh, fish passes as it relates to road sediment projects, we'll just talk about sediment reduction projects. So we've completed about 273 miles of um, road drainage improvements and or uh, road decommissioning efforts. That's resulted in over 600,000 cubic yards of sediment being prevented from entering streams. So I'm a visual thinker, um, I always, need a way to put that in, into a kind of a frame of reference that I can understand. So real crude math, but you can imagine that's about 62,000 dump trunks of sediment. And if you lined all of those dump trucks up, kind of assume each one's about um, 25 feet in length, if you lined them up end to end, that would extend 297 miles. And that's essentially from San Francisco to the town of Trinidad in, in uh, just north of Arcata. So sediment reduction can take place in several ways. Um, we, as in the previous slide, we talk about road drainage improvements. We also decommission abandoned roads. We do fish passage improvement. And oftentimes whatever wood is um, exhumed during the decommissioning process, we try to place in the stream. So again, our program began with large scale sediment inventories followed by multi-phase implementation and we continue to work on similar efforts. Um, you know, these efforts, they start with a lot of coordination between partners, landowners and land managers and agencies. Um, then we pursue grant funding to complete a sediment source or fish passage inventory. Um, sometimes that's a few miles, sometimes it's an entire watershed. Um, and then in coordination with the landowner, um, we develop a kind of a, a, desire, a desired futures conditions map. And that basically helps prioritize our treatment plan so we can systematically decommission roads that the landowner knows are no longer needed and we can upgrade roads that are still integral to their operations. Um, and then we typically will pursue implementation funding um, as it's identified in the plan and that can occur over several years. Um, this model has worked really well for us, so we have replicated it across many watersheds. And here's an example just of a few of the watersheds that we've worked in that have had several phases of sediment reduction work done. Hollow Tree Creek's kind of a nice one because in that example with Mendocino Redwood Company, we virtually um, decommissioned every road that could possibly be decommissioned in that watershed. So our in-stream work today probably dominates a lot of the work that we do every year. Um, and despite all the work that we've done, 115 miles of stream treat, treated, over 6,000 pieces of wood added, at over 2,000 sites, 
Um, we still have a lot of work to do. There was a report that the Nature Conservancy put together that basically stated it would take about 50 years for us to put enough wood in streams um, at densities that, that, that would have occurred maybe under pristine conditions um, at the current rate that not just to you, but that the restoration community overall is taking. So we've really been trying to um, increase the pace and scale that we're, that we're adding wood into streams. And we are actually awarded the Water Quality Stewardship Award last year by the North Coast Regional Water Board for our large wood program. And that award, it was really special to us because um, it was also in, it was awarded to us with our partners, Ken Smith and Chris Blanco, who have done um, the predominant amount of um, wood loading. They, they're the contractors that are actually getting the work done. Um, Hey, Anna, this is Sam. We just have a couple more minutes left for this. Okay, that's great. great. Thanks. Thank I'm, yeah. I'm just wrapping up, so that's perfect. perfect. Okay, so um, I won't go into too much depth about the history of large wood. I think most of you probably understand why we put wooden streams, but, you know, the, the, the kind of quickest um, history lesson I can give you is that before European settlement, there was a lot of wood in our streams and it was recruited naturally, old trees would fall in. And, um, and then uh, cause scour in the stream channel and knock over new trees. And there was just kind of this conveyor belt of wood constantly being introduced into the stream and being transported. Um, then we had extensive logging um, throughout various periods in our history. And when that logging occurred, um, a lot of the streams were cleared uh, or the big stream side riparian trees were harvested. Um, and then deleterious quantities of waste were then thrown into the stream channel. So we got this abundance of wood in the channel, but not large long pieces of wood that can actually um, alter the stream's geomorphology. And so then there was a big conservation movement to remove all of that wood and they might've even been too effective because then our streams were virtually devoid of large wood. And we've been working you know, since the, the late nineties um, at uh, trying to get those functional pieces of wood back in the channel. So wood goes in the channel for a lot of different reasons. Um, one is for enhancing stream complexity so that is um, looking at pool formation and providing shelter and cover. Um, here's a, a project that we completed in the Little North Fork of Big River. Um, here's an example of some of the post-project monitoring we did on that project. And if you notice the, the yellow line is from um, 2018, the blue line is from 2019, and all the little dots represent pieces of wood. And everywhere where there's a dot, you can see a pretty good divergence between those two lines. And that was just in one year. And it probably wasn't, and that actually wasn't even a super intense um, stream flow a year for us. There wasn't a lot of rainfall. Um, so, so we put in wood to help uh, create habitat for fish and to make streams more complex. We also put in wood to sort and collect sediment. So I, I showed you guys the picture of that old dam removal in Olds Creek. Well, if you look on the pictures on the left, that's what the channel looked like downstream of the dam because it was holding all of the spawning sediment behind it. And so we released it. And at the same time that we took out the dam, we put in all of this wood and you can immediately see the response. That wood was able to um, recruit sediment and collect it. And we even saw salmon reds in that reach right after we did the project. We put large wood in for grade control. This happens a lot when we have to um, excavate a new channel or do any kind of channel um, reconstruction. And um, this wood will help keep that channel in its new place. This is usually engineered. And we use large wood for channel incision. So the picture on the left shows this um, really incised channel um, and the, the, the the upper picture on the left shows what it looked like initially. The picture below that shows this, what we kind of call a, um, a in, you know, we have permeable and impermeable jams. And we've put all this wood in to try to collect sediment and build the channel back up and reconnect it with its floodplain so it can eventually look like the picture on the right, which is what 
Manly Gulch looks like throughout much of its stream. Um, but there is this one section that is really, really horribly incised and we're trying to, to raise the stream bed back up. We also have been involved in whole tree augmentation where we literally dig out an entire tree and push it in. These are some of my favorite projects. There are not a lot of places where you can do this safely, but we've been able to do it in the South Fork 10 mile. And then we just completed a first phase of a project like this in the North Fork Navarro, and we'll be embarking on another one this summer. We've been working on off-channel habitat enhancement. Um, this is in Lawrence Creek, which is in the Van Dusen River. We've been partnering with NOAA and Humboldt Redwood Company. This project was really exciting. We, um, we designed and implemented this project in one year and the coho returns have been astounding. We've been doing minnow trapping and it, this pond is just teeming with fish um, in the winter. And that's its primary um, function is to provide refugia for rearing juvenile fish during large storm events. But then we had the added benefit that the pond has stayed wet and has water quality that's um, healthy enough that fish have reared through the summers. So we're growing bigger fish in these ponds in the summers that will hopefully have a better chance of making it out to the ocean and returning. Um, and we've also worked on creating some alcove habitat where we just, you know, essentially, uh, we've done it in a couple of different places and, and we just kind of um, make a little side uh, habitat off of a main channel so that fish also can get out of those high stream flows. So this is my last slide. And it's just a little uh, look forward to 2021. We'll be working on about 12 to 15 projects. There's a few that we just got funded. So we're not sure if we'll be able to start in the summer or not, but we'll try. And that's gonna occur um, in Humboldt and Mendocino counties premier, predominantly. So that's all I've got and I'm ready for questions. Awesome, thanks for the presentation, Anna. Um, I think that was super informative. And uh, we do have some questions uh, for you. Again, we'll try and go through a few, but we'll, we'll get started on Tim's presentation here pretty shortly. Um, so the first question um, from Lonnie Barnes is, um, he was asking about the decline attributed to the Trinity River um, for salmon and steelhead. What's your view on the restoration work they did? Oh, um, well, I wouldn't say that the decline is, is, is related to the, any of the restoration work that they've been doing in the Trinity River. And um, although I am aware of some of the work that they've been doing, um, it, I'm not incredibly knowledgeable. A, a lot of the work that they've been doing has been pretty innov innovative and it's really helped advance other restoration science. Um, so I think Overall, the restoration work that's happening in the Trinity is it has a, a lot of benefits even beyond those directly to the fisheries there. Um, it's a huge system, it's complex. Uh, I'm really kind of maybe lucky that I work in smaller systems because um, you just, um, the, the, the magnitude and the scale of the work that you do in a really large system like the Trinity just it involves so much work so much planning and design and engineering um so um I think that's a really good question I don't think I have like a great answer for you unfortunately uh and I'm not even sure why there were big declines in the Trinity it's actually that kind of piques my interest a bit um but it probably just has to do with um, water years. Um, years like this year, even though we're seeing a lot of salmon come up, if there's not a lot of stream flow in the tributaries that surround these bigger systems, then the distribution of fish gets really localized. Um, and that could have something to do with what's happened over the last five years. Um, Sam, do we want to do a few more right now? Yeah, Char Charlie, do you want to ask one more question and then we'll save the rest of the questions for the end? Yeah, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll punt on the, the water diversions to Southern California until the end. I think that's uh, maybe a better panel discussion. Um, but Anna, for you, um, Steve McClary wanted you to comment on the interaction between fire reduction programs and, and forest health and how that uh, may impact um, fish habitat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I actually think that there can be a pretty cool nexus between fire reduction uh, or fuels reduction work 
and fisheries restoration. And we're really trying to pilot a couple of ideas that we have about how those two forms of land management could um, coincide. So um, a lot of the forest stands here are, are so over dense um, that it requires a lot of mechanical fuels reduction before you can even get to a point where you'd be allowed to do like um, prescribed berms and things like that. And that's a really expensive and labor intensive effort. Um, and so what, and it produces quite a bit of slash, like a lot of material, and you have to figure out what to do with that material. So we've been working with some of our partners, like the Redwood Forest Foundation that has an active biochar kiln. Um, and we're trying to come up with some ideas about how we can partner fuels reduction work with restoration work, looking at carbon sequestration, looking at opportunities to potentially um, remediate um, unnatural hydrologic features like, like road drainage gullies that never really should have been there and maybe using slash to help slow spread and sink water in those gullies. Um, and all of this is like really preliminary and we're, we, we've um, you know, been successful in securing some funds to, to start looking into that, um, but we're still working on it. But you know, I think Thinking like a watershed, you know, if we want healthy streams, we have to have healthy forests too. And, and to do that, we need to look at the, um, the, the kind of the diversity of, of aged trees in our stands. And we need to look at the diversity of, of species composition. Um, and I, I, I do think that the, that the two efforts are not independent. I think they're, they're pretty well related. Um, so hopefully that addresses your question. Great, thanks, Anna. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on. Again, thanks for the great presentation. Your questions, if they weren't answered, we'll try and get to them at the end. But also too, just to reiterate, please respond uh, in the chat to the private panelist channel with your name and email so that we can make sure that you get your questions answered, as well as send you a link to this presentation as well and connect with you afterwards. Um, so again, um, We'll go ahead and move to Tim. So Tim, go ahead and start your presentation. Uh, you might need to unmute as well here. All right, Sam, I un unmuted. Okay. Anna, thanks. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, it's uh, I learned a heck of a lot, and and one of the things I learned is some of the things that you do are so very similar to the things that I do, and some of the things that you do are very different. And part of it is because of the diversity of the landscape that we work within. I think I'll step step back. My name is Tim Fromm. I think I took my picture off happily for you guys. Tim, I don't see your screen being shared yet either. Are you seeing the uh, PowerPoint yet? We need to probably have your video on, Tim. Mm. Click the start video function. Uh, Click on that guy right there. And in the big one. <laughs> Uh, hang on a sec. You have to share screen. Uh, yeah. Scroll up to you. Yeah. So I would just close everything and tell you only what you want left. Oh, hey, jeez. Don't you talk at all? Use your screen. All right, hey, uh, Sam, uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit and my wife will be uh, trying to manage getting my shared screen up. I think she can probably figure it out. Well, my name is Tim Fromm. I work on the Central Coast of California, live down in Carmel Valley. Uh, the landscape I work on is, uh, is pretty broad. It goes generally from south of San Francisco, all the way down to San Luis Obispo, those watersheds that drain towards the ocean. What do we get, Chris? We see your we see your screen now, so you're just gonna have to 
Yeah, Scroll to the right side. All right, yeah, hang on a sec. Man. How's that look? Perfect. Huh. It's hard. It's hard to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, it was either going to be my fifteen-year-old daughter or my wife, and thank goodness my wife walked by. Um, so uh, I'm an old-time steelhead fisherman. I got my first fly rod in 1962. It was an old Fenwick Ferrolite, seven foot five weight, which I still own. Still have it hanging on the wall, but I take out now and then. And I have a kind of a odd history to get to the point that I'm working for Trot Unlimited. I uh, got out of college at San Luis Obispo a long time ago, last century. Uh, went to work, had a land survey business. Uh, and then after my knees started getting grouchy when I got to be about 50 years old, I developed a program with the, the uh, Farm Bureau Worked with the farmers in San Mateo County and then broadly in the central coast of California for about 10 years, working on water issues. Became, a, became aware of Trout Unlimited during that time because TU engaged with the farming community and I sat across the table with uh, Brian Johnson, who's now our state director. I was representing the farmers, he was representing TU and we came to accommodations on how to improve conditions for both the farming landscape and the, and the fisheries. It attracted me because I'm an old time fisherman. Um, and back of me, I got a picture of my dad when he was 45 years old, holding up about a 14 pound steelhead that he picked up out of the Garcia River. Uh, I'm very fond of the old stories and the old timers. And I'm fond of young folks thinking they're gonna be steelhead fishermen. So I do this work because I like to think that we can not only protect, but enhance the steelhead populations. Um, not just because there are wonderful species, but because, you know, we're anglers and we like to, uh, we like to get out. Um, recovering steelhead in the central coast is, uh, you have to be optimistic, but you know, to be a good fisherman, you have to be optimistic. And there, re there is reason for optimism when you think about recovering steelhead on the central coast. They persist, they're present, in I think every small watershed, intermittent or perennial that drains to the Pacific Ocean in, in this landscape. Sometimes they express themselves as anadromous fish and sometimes they're remnants of the anadromy and they're, they become uh, resident coastal rainbows. But those coastal rainbows, little nine inch coastal rainbow buck is able to uh, fertilize a, a big hen like I'm holding there in the lower left because they're the same animal. And it's a way that the steelhead can express the wide diversity of their life history choices that, uh, that gives us the optimism uh, because we can have bad years. We can have years like this year, which I hope changes, but right now because of extremely low flows, sandbars have not opened and adult fish are hanging around outside, they can't get in. Uh, rearing juveniles that are in the coastal estuaries can't get out. Um, uh, but that's not a, I mean, that's horrible, but it's not a, a complete disaster for steelhead because steelhead are so diverse and flexible that, you know, they can hang out in the lagoon or, or move upstream and, and uh, spend another year in the, in the stream and the adults outside can, if they find another stream that, uh, that's draining into the, into the ocean, they may choose that one to wander into. Or they may just stay outside, get bigger, and come back as bigger adults. They don't perish because they lose a year. And that's one of the things that makes it possible to think that we can recover these fish. And there's, similar to Anna, there are several project types that uh, we know will help conditions for steelhead. Um, depending on the stream we're looking at, certain time of years, stream conditions, in stream flows get low. They naturally get low in the late summer on these coastal streams, but if there's folks that are borrowing water or using water, using their legitimate riparian rights for irrigation or, or whatever they, they believe their rights are, um, there's competition for that water. And we know if we can find and keep more water in the streams, we 
basically increase the carrying capacity of that stream because we broaden the amount of habitat available and we rear more fish and rear, you know, more surviving juveniles means more fish moving out to the ocean and more adults coming back and that's how we start recovering. Uh, Anna mentioned uh, removing priority barriers, migration barriers from high quality streams. Uh, what that means is that as a fish is moving upstream, if, uh, if it runs into something that it can't cavort over, then they are stuck in that range of habitat down below that structure. Oftentimes barriers are just um, partial barriers so that on, a, on very high flows, they may swim over the top of them, but then as flows drop, those adults can't return to the ocean and juveniles can't migrate downstream. So even barriers that allow fish to pass in some flows are problematic for recovering steelhead. Some of the coastal streams in, in Central California are fantastically productive estuaries. Lagoons that, uh, that have lots of food for small fish to rear. And they're extremely important to those streams. But some of the streams that you see, for example, on the Big Sur coast have no lagoons at all. In fact, the streams just wander across rocky beaches. But even in those streams, uh, fish have figured out for their circumstance how to persist and how to how to uh, thrive. Um, the NOAA Science Center doing lots of work down in the Big Sur River finds that fish in, for example, Big Creek on the Big Sur River, Big Sur Coast, will wander out into the ocean across those rocky beaches as juveniles. And because they have tracking systems for these fish, they see them return and then go out again, maybe wander up the coast, and then return back to, to Big Creek. And fish that, um, that do that in Big Creek, maybe they're unique, but you don't see that in the Salinas, for example, but the fish individually in the watersheds seem to have different survival strategies. Pretty cool. One of the differences between Anne and my work is she's dealing with loggers all the time. And it's more likely when I'm negotiating with, with folks, I'm, I'm dealing with uh, ranchers and farmers. So yeah, in order to get a quality project accomplished, we have to be able to understand the needs of the people across the table from us. We have to be able to rationalize to them the type of project which we're suggesting can actually benefit or certainly not take their interest backwards. So it's encouraging that awful lot of the farmers, and I suspect a lot of the loggers that Anna works with, are actually sympathetic to fish. Uh, and they don't mind improving conditions for fish, just so they don't go backwards. It's a really big landscape, like I say, and, and uh, we can't think that we know everything about every watershed. And so we have to really rely, as Anna suggested, on local partners. Uh, when I, I spent most of my life up in Half Moon Bay, I moved down to um, Monterey area. I didn't know too darn much about the Carmel River, but I just bided my time, spent a couple of years learning, talking to local stakeholders like the, the Carmel River Steelheaders, learned about projects that were sitting on the shelves that people knew about, and then TU allowed us to start digging in. You're looking at the watershed of uh, the Carmel River there, and oh, we have a dozen or 15 projects underway, varieties of uh, barrier projects and stream flow improvement projects, floodplain projects. And I could, I could envision and start working those projects because we had roadmaps. We had recovery plans for the, th for the threatened steelhead that suggest the type of projects that help in each of the watersheds. We have watershed plans that folks like the Resource Conservation District uh, embarked on that, that further refining the type of projects that help. Uh, the local water district went through and identified and prioritized barriers. Well, I had a whole bunch of roadmaps, but nobody was actually doing the work. So TU digs in and we start 
start working on this watershed. We talked about barriers to migration. Just want to run through a couple type of projects and, and Anna did some of this. I used to talk to cities and urban folks and explain when, when they think that farming is this romantic activity. Well, farming is dusty and noisy. And, and honestly, so is restoring, restoring habitat. Excuse me. So this particular um, barrier was the number four priority barrier in the Carmel River. Uh, it was uh, owned by a landowner who has a, who has a, uh, a number of recreational cabins. Uh, the barrier, as we'll see in a little bit, was a, a concrete ford which was a, a pretty common artifact in Monterey County. When people want to cross the river, they were looking for some durable way to do it. And basically they would either take the bulldozer blade and push up a berm of, of soil and then lip it with a bunch of concrete, or they would just pour a bunch of concrete and start driving across it. Sometimes it'd be vented culverts, sometimes not. Uh, you see them scattered all around the, the uh, Monterey coast. Uh, and that's what this particular one was. So I'm going to run through a little video here of just so you can get a sense of what these projects really look like and how it gets accomplished. And you have to envision as we go along, you start from zero. You start with a discussion with the landowner and a handshake. And then you start trying to raise the money to design projects and you work with the engineers, the civil, the structural geotech folks to come up with designs that improve conditions for fish and improve conditions for the landowners. You then raise money to do the construction. Uh, in this case, we had a fabulous partnership with the landowner who was a contractor. We we're able to build this similar to what Anna does with the loggers at a pretty reasonable price, but um, we had to get the permits, had to buy the material, and we had to keep the property owner pretty much happy the entire time. So let's take a look, see what this looks like here. San Clemente Creek. It's an example of these old concrete fords. Those are low flow conditions on this creek. High flows, water passes over the top. People can't drive across. Plans have to be uh, reviewed by any number of agencies, be consistent with the profile of the channel you're trying to create. When we get to a construction, we have to make sure we're excluding the fish that are present in that stream section because we have to dewater a portion of the creek, that portion which we're actually constructing. So there's a dewatered section. Those I-beams come from the state of Oregon. There was three of them, 35 feet long. It's about $75,000 of wood there. These are rocky bottomed creeks. Excavation has to be well below the channel. These are the footings for the bridge that we're constructing. Prevailing wage job, so we had to make sure that uh, the pre-mixed ready mix concrete and the concrete pumpers were uh, adhering to the Department of Industrial Relations. And Tarantula was the first guy to walk across the bridge. I 
just completed this project. I'm waiting for flows to come up so I can take a nice picture of the stream. Number of partners, funders, contractors. There's the fellow that owns the property and was was actually doing the construction, a fellow named Bruce Dormady. He was so happy with Trot Unlimited that he joined the local chapter. Pretty happy with that guy. The um, This is a good example of this project of you just got to hang in there. We were uh, just about ready to go to construction, even after, you know, fighting out the old COVID stuff all summer long. Within about a day of construction, the Carmel wildfire started. It started on the easterly side of this fellow's uh, 500 acres, and he had to spend two weeks on the dozer protecting his property. We all had to evacuate. Uh, I live in Carmel Valley. We had to evacu evacuate. We had to put this project to sleep for a couple weeks, actually about three weeks. But because we were, we had the, the structure on site, we were able to just recommence, and we got this project done this year. Uh, somebody asked about fi fires earlier. I had another project further up this uh, same watershed and we had to evacuate our surveyors out of the site because the wildfire was was taken off so fast. And I had one project which we uh, were one day away from mobilizing a million and a half dollar construction project. We had to put it to sleep for the year because that was right in the uh, in the fire zone and that place was evacuated for several weeks. We're given a very short window of construction opportunity with the agencies. Um, you have to get uh, stream bed alteration agreements with the fish and game, and you have to satisfy protective measures for a variety of threatened and endangered species. And we're only allowed to work from August 15th until middle of October. And these jobs, you just have to go like Billy Heck to get them done in that short window. And we have to get them done because once you start, you got to get them done. Otherwise, people can't get across the river. Pretty challenging, but it's um, satisfying when you get, get them accomplished. Yeah, nice coastal steelhead. Just well, real quick, Anna mentioned dams. We got them in all varieties around here. One on the left is Gone San Clemente Dam. That was a uh, an antique in the Carmel River. Dandy to get it out of there. The one on the right is, uh, is a hundred and something year old artifact of uh, an agricultural operation, which we now have the agencies agreeing that uh, if we can find the money, we're just going to blast the dang thing out and let the creek rearrange itself. Uh, that one's up in Santa Clara County. In a couple of weeks, you're going to hear from the California Water Project. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a hybrid because I got a foot in both worlds and the, the part of my job is with uh, water, improving water conditions. Uh, I work with a team. We have uh, fabulous folks up in Emeryville. We have um, staff attorney, Matt Clifford, Marianne King, Sam Davidson keeps us on track. And then uh, um, we always like to keep him happy when he wants us to write a blog of some sort, but um, I really rely on our team. And, and even up on the North Coast, uh, right now I'm working with Anna. I asked her to come down and help review projects down here in the Central Coast. and. And, and it's, it's wonderful having uh, strong partnerships with our, with our peers themselves. A water project, uh, again, you know, dirty and dusty. This is a, an example of building an off-stream pond for a farm. Building it big enough so that you capture winter water. It's uh, enough stored water so the farmer stops pumping the creek during the months of August, September, October in the critically low flows. Uh, it's a, uh, a complicated project. Uh, you know, you have to fundraise for design again and for construction. There's water rights associated with it. Um, you certainly have to uh, negotiate well with the farmer, but the advantage they have is on drought years where there's very little water in the summertime for their riparian diversions to their irrigation. When you have stored winter water, it helps. And for the fish, we no longer have a 200 gallon a minute pump in the creek, which is a half a CFS, which in this particular small creek significantly increases or allows a um, substantial amount of water to stay in the creek, again, providing enough water for rearing. Um, this one was uh, 
uh, I don't know, 30,000 cubic yards of material and uh, 18 acre feet, it's 6 million gallons of water, something like that. Uh, quite a project. It's one of four that we have in this one particular watershed. And we have substantially increased the stream flow in this little coastal stream. Go, go, go. And I mentioned floodplains real quickly. Uh, there's not a lot of opportunities to do really magnificent floodplain work on the Central Coast because, as you can imagine, Central Coast floodplains and lower part of the watersheds are full of, uh, of residential uh, developments. But here's a, here's a golf course that came up for sale a couple of years ago. And TU dug in with uh, Trust Republic Lands and the local, uh, one of the local uh, NGOs, the Santa Lucia Conservancy. And $11 million was raised uh, and the property, the golf course was purchased. Irrigation was retired. It's now the headquarters for the local uh, regional park district. There's one mile of the Carmel River, both sides that uh, bisect this golf course, which we now are in the process of uh, working with uh, a team to look at how to recapture the useful um, floodplain that will flood on base winter flows, uh, which means a lot to fish. Uh, if you have a, a deeply incised river, when you get high flows, there's no refugia for the fish. If you spread them out through a, a floodplain that's properly designed to mimic uh, nature, actually to just recreate what was there, fish have a chance to move away from the high flow velocity, have a chance to persist even during the highest flows. There's a number of benefits to a well-designed floodplain project well beyond flood remediation, well beyond groundwater recharge, uh, including uh, tremendous benefits for uh, fish and fauna. I got angular driven science in here because I love this stuff, being a fisherman. I've been, been working with the TU science team in Boise and they, they produce these mobile apps to help us gather data for different, different streams. We're getting information straight from the fishermen. Um, not only uh, it, it's, it's beyond just the simple uh, angler survey, uh, we ask for their observations um, so that we can, in one case, um, make a stronger case to establish a wild trout designation for Pescadero Creek. And in one case, we've been working with the NOAA Science Center on um, tagging striped bass and then tracking location based on angler recapture. I believe in anglers um, uh, that are observant and willing to share their observations. Um, being a old time angler myself, I always felt that uh, citizen science, angler science, uh, we can contribute. And this is being adopted and I think it's being well received. So just a couple images about why we do this. Yeah, these are fish on the left or uh, some nice examples of Central Coast steelhead from last year. And uh, the image on the right is my daughter a few years ago um, and she's still looking for her first big adult steelhead, but she has captured some nice juvenile steelhead and, and she's got the bug and I, I appreciate that. So I want to thank you guys uh, uh, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, Tim. Um, we have a couple questions for you here. Um, first from, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, but yes, are you familiar with the Almaden Lake project to connect the Guadalupe River and Almitos Creek by removing the thermal barrier created by the lake? Any opinions on the likelihood of success of that project? Uh, I am not. So my landscape uh, deals with the watersheds that are draining towards the ocean and not the bay. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes you, you just have to recognize that you can't, uh, you can't be knowledgeable about, about everything. And, the, and those landscapes or those, those drainages moving to the, to the bay, to San Francisco Bay, I know are important, but I'm just kind of blank on them. 
We have one from Lauren. Um, and it says, Tim, do you want to mention recycling wastewater as a way of in, in increasing in-stream flows or chat about that real quick? I think there's a good example of, um, if you look at the, uh, the San Mateo County coast, um, they do not, re they don't treat and reuse their recycled water or they do not utilize recycled water. They still have uh, secondary uh, treated water that they dispose. Uh, there's a high volume production well adjacent to Pillar Cedos Creek, um, which is pushing water about three miles to the south to a golf course, and that's their primary irrigation. If that operation was actually reclaiming water and retiring that production uh, well, production water well, uh, it would it's believed dramatically improved conditions in the estuary of Pillar Cedos Creek, thereby giving a better chance to recover fish in Pillar Cedos. So I'm a big believer in recycled water. Um, Monterey County is a wide, broad adopter of uh, recycled water, um, not for improving stream conditions, but there are circumstances where you can make the connection that improving recycled water projects will improve conditions for steelhead. Great, thanks. Um, and then we have a couple questions and, and Anna, feel free to chime in too once we get to kind of the more generic salmon and seahood uh, questions. We have one um, from Bill Bridges who says, I was interested in the steelhead population trends and the general status of the river from a healthy river standpoint. I'm guessing he's uh, talking about North Coast and Central Coast rivers. Bill was asking about the Russian River specifically. Oh. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, probably the, the best. <laughs> so, the Russian's interesting because it's kind of smack dab in, in between the work Kim's doing and the work Anna's doing. So the Russian probably looked more like Anna's rivers originally and is looking more like Kim's rivers. So uh, in-stream flows are a huge problem here, um, followed very closely by uh, winter refugia. Um, due to urbanization. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough battle for fish here. Um, there's a large uh, steelhead hatchery component here. So we do see fairly decent steelhead returns, but the thinking is that most of those are, are or the population's highly intergressed. Um, for coho, there's also a large hatchery component um, and steelhead were, were functionally extinct in the watershed in the early 2000s. Um, receiving just like less than 10 adults. So numbers are now up to oh, three to 500 est you know, estimated adult returns every year, but um, about 150,000 uh, broodstock hatchery program juveniles go into the watershed every year. So it's, uh, you know, there's fish in it, but it's definitely a struggle here. Um, there's been a couple questions about the uh, the car tire chemicals and, and their impacts on coho. I don't know if anyone has any more information other, you know, I'm sure we've all seen that article, um, but if anyone has kind of more info on it or, or how to use looking into that, um, we've had a couple, a couple uh, participants asking about it. Yeah, well, I know Matt Clifford is um, in the very probably like early stages of trying to figure out if there's any kind of policy work that could be um, taken on uh, related to that. The nice, I mean, not that this, that's a nice thing, this PP6 chemical that's derived from a, um, a preservative that's put in car tires. Um, you know, the nice thing about, about something like that where it's so causal is that we can see exactly what, now we have a good understanding of what that is and we can, react and try to either work with the water board or, or, or work with other organizations to try and develop some policy to help protect that. I think there's a lot of questions we still have like up here where a lot of our streams are connected to rural roads. Is it as big of an issue? Um, you know, there's that study was very telling in a very urban environment. And we know that that, um, chemicals probably prolific throughout, you know, the U.S., but definitely in the, uh, in the West where, where salmon streams are. But I think, um, 
I think there's a lot of questions about communities that are a little more rural and how big of an impact they have on salmon streams in less urban environments. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, the research is, is pretty compelling that that's a pretty significant impact that we need to address. There's a question from Steve Cochran um, regarding how do you engage reluctant to participate landowners? Mm. It's a good no, question. it's a broad question. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll start. And Tim, you, I'm sure you have good stories too. I mean, you can't force anyone to do it, you know, to, to, to volunteer to do restoration. So um, working with a reluctant landowner can be pretty difficult. Um, one thing that tends to work well is if you can find common ground or um, if you can incentivize your project to some extent, you know, finding some component of your work that might actually benefit that reluctant landowner. Um, understanding what their concerns are is also a pretty big part of that. If you can really get to the root of what the primary issue is, a lot of times we can work around those issues. I mean, one of the great things about working for Child Unlimited is, is that that's, that's pretty much what we do is we try to find solutions to complex problems and we've, we've been able to do that um, by being creative and, and by just being human. I mean, I most of the time I can really understand why a landowner might be reluctant to, to work on a project. Um, so kind of trying to see things from their perspective too, I think helps a lot. So I was, I was thinking about that. Uh, I think that was a pretty cool question. Uh, up on the San Mateo coast, uh, uh, the farming community is uh, very tight-lipped. Uh, they, uh, they're somewhat insular, I'd say, uh, but they um, they all they all belong to the local farm bureau. They all go to the farm bureau meetings. And you know, ten years ago, when Trout Unlimited wanted to work on some of the streams in, in San Mateo County, they were smart enough, I think, to go reach out not to the farmers to begin with, but they contracted with the farm bureau to reach out to the farmers and bring them to the table. And then the Farm Bureau and myself was, uh, was, was there to uh, kind, of, kind of act as a buffer so that the farmers didn't feel like they were being lectured to. Um, the other thing to think about is if you're gonna have a, a meeting that you wanna invite property owners, quite often you're more successful if you find some outfit like a, a Grange or a Farm Bureau or a, a, a logging uh, industry group to conduct the meeting, to hold the meeting. So they're in charge of the meeting. They don't feel like, again, they're being lectured to. Um, in this case, Tread Unlimited would be invited by them. And they're more open, typically. They're more willing to engage when they're in charge of the meeting. Sometimes uh, being able to point to success, success, I think that that's important. Um, if you can uh, show a farmer that uh, just down the road, uh, uh, there's another farmer that uh, benefited by the work that we did. Uh, that goes a long ways. You know, the folks will talk to each other. Um, just being present um, and being honest is a big deal. Uh, it's hard for somebody just to walk into a new landscape and think they're going to be able to explain to folks what's best for them. And sometimes we just have to be smart enough to take a pass on the project and find some other local entity that, uh, that has the ear of the, those folks and let them do it. So we become support for like a local resource conservation district and let them manage a project. So, you know, there's, there's different, uh, different tools and basically it's just, you know, common sense and humanity and trying to not dictate to people or, but be able to, able to listen and try to come to an accommodation. So we've just got a couple of questions left. Um, we have on this one is maybe for Sam Davidson could field. Um, and it's, it's basically about the Delta tunnels, tunnels so uh, water diversion going to Southern California and its impact on returning sam salmon numbers. So I assume that's uh, Delta water management specifically. Uh, yeah, that's Central Valley, Sacramento and San Joaquin River systems. Um, 
To be honest, most of our work, we, we have two, our water attorney, Matt Clifford, and our, our science director in California, Renee Henry, who will be one of our presenters next week, um, and our state director, Brian Johnson, uh, all work at a fairly high level on policy uh, related to water management, particularly in and around the Delta. It's, uh, as far as I know, it's not, um, I mean, there are a whole, there are a multitude of factors affecting uh, salmon and Central Valley salmon and steelhead numbers uh, and their fairly steady decline. Um, and we do some work on, in the negotiations, uh, for example, the Bay Delta plan, the, uh, um, uh, that, that, uh, the state water board is going through or has gone through for the San Joaquin River and is going through for the Sacramento River that looks at uh, adjusting the requirements for the, the flow requirements um, through the Delta. And um, to be honest, there are other entities that are more heavily invested uh, in those processes than we are. TU typically likes to dedicate our resources to places where we know we can actually make a meaningful and oftentimes on the ground watershed specific uh, impact. And, um, and so most of our energy is not going to trying to address the longstanding struggle over the volumes of water that are that's allowed to flow through the Delta or that are pumped out of the pumping station near Tracy and sent to the Southern Central Valley and, and Southern California. But we do know that, I think the science is pretty clear that we had more water, that we allowed more water to flow through the Delta at critical times for fish uh, and through the tributaries to the San Joaquin and the Sacramento, or to, particularly to the, Sac to the San Joaquin at times that are important for fish, we they would it would help. Thanks, Sam. Um, the last question we have probably for Tim uh, is: Has TU worked on the Gualala River? Uh, that's, that's, an, that's an Anna's jury. Oh, sorry, Anna. Excuse me. <laughs> I can, I can tell you lots of stories about the Guadalajara River. <laughs> right. Actually, funny that came up. I got a call this morning um, about the Wallala. Actually, um, Sonoma County RCD is working on doing some watershed coordination. They're working on a grant proposal to try and, um, kind of, I, I think, to, to get people talking more about doing restoration of the Wallala. Um, I am not aware of any restoration that our programs done on the Wallala. There are some projects from the beginning of our, um, you know, time as a project from, from the late 90s that were just lost to us. So it's possible, um, particularly because I think Craig Bell even lived in the Wallala for a while. It's possible that we've done some small scale restoration, but, but I don't have any record of it. And I think in part because there's the Wallala River Watershed Council and they have kind of for a long time just taken the lead on doing restoration in that watershed. In fact, the accelerated recruitment work that we do, we learned from them. So um, there's some really active folks in that basin. And um, as I mentioned to this um, representative from the RCD, uh, the Wallala is, I worked in the Wallala years and years ago when I worked for CDFW. It's really beautiful and I really like it. Um, but, you know, no one, we haven't really had anyone ask us um, to help out down there. And because there's existing watershed groups doing good work, we haven't um, been very involved in restoration. Thanks. Uh, I think that actually wraps up all of the questions for tonight. Again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email um, either Tim or Anna, um, which their email is on the screen right now, or myself, and I'll make sure to get you connected directly with a staff member that can answer your question. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our speakers again for uh, the presentations. Those were great and super informative, and 
um, we'll be sending out emails with the links for this talk and also the links for the next talk coming up. So thanks again, everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and end the call now, uh, but have a great rest of your night. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. Sam, Sam, and Charlie. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Be well. <laughs>